Hello and welcome to today's podcast. I'm Paul Tunner, the founder of Pharma Forum, and really pleased to welcome Elia Stupka, Managing Director of Angelini Ventures today. We're going to talk about his work at Angelini Ventures. And uh, Elia, it's great to speak with you today. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Paul. Great to speak to you today. Let's start with just a bit about your role and the organization, given the headline of kind of what you're doing and what that involves for you. Sure. It's a uh... I, I'm the managing director of Angelini Ventures. Angelini Ventures is a recently launched fund. It's a 300 million uh, fund in healthcare. We operate uh, mainly in Europe and uh, North America and Israel. And uh, we are uh, on a path to invest in companies that we believe are transformational in healthcare that have uh, you know, a long-term impact on how healthcare functions and we do that by looking across you know digital health life sciences medical devices smart solutions where uh, we are quite agnostic to how problems are solved as long as it has an impact on on unmet uh, unmet needs um i'm managing director alongside with uh, paolo di giorgio uh, who is also ceo and uh yeah we we launched this adventure a few months ago and uh, we're excited to to enter the space and invest in uh, businesses that can change this ecosystem. Fantastic. And I, I know you joined Angelini Ventures fairly recently. I'm always intrigued by people's background and the journey that's brought you there. So what's been your career path? Tell me tell me what, what your journey's been. Yeah, I'll try to uh, you know, find a way to, to concisely tell you about my career path because I've taken a few hops and sure. you know changed a few roles. But I started out as a research scientist. I was... Uh, uh, my very first work was working on the Human Genome Project, so I feel very, you know, honoured in a way and privileged to have been part of that in the UK in Cambridge uh, right. back in 99, 2001. And that really led me, you know, at a time where uh, a lot was changing. It was a time when Linux was coming and open source and high performance computing and all those things. Uh, so I became what at the time hardly existed, which was a bioinformatician, so somebody meddling with data and, and biology. Yep. Um, Moved to Singapore, worked on launching a genome project here in Singapore, which was also kind of a flagship project for Asia. First genome project, first, uh, again, bioinformatics computing project in the continent. Uh, I always was driven in my career path to have impact. So I wanted to get closer to the clinical space. And I started by uh, coming back to Europe, working for the Teleton Foundation on rare diseases, uh, still in the research space. Um, then in London, working at UCL and with Great Ormond Street Hospital and other organizations there, uh, Queen Mary, um, on really starting to bring the first you know, applications of genomics to rare diseases and diagnosing kids with rare diseases. Um, then worked in Serafale Hospital, uh, where we first brought the first uh, gene therapy trials that were EMA approved. And again, I, had, I was heading up a genome center there. So uh, we did a lot of work in the trials to look at safety, look at, you know, uh, at improving at improving those trials. So I then felt I needed to understand how the, you know, the what at the time seemed like the dark side, you know, the, the pharma side, the industry side uh, looked like and how it worked. And so I, I moved to Beringer Ingelheim Pharma. It was a fantastic journey of learning. I realized how much work goes into after an academic project shows some hope, you know, how much work it takes to validate and really bring to uh, to, to validation and market, you know, a solution. Worked with them for five years. Um, it was also time with BI I was investing a lot in external innovation. So we invested in startups and labs around the world from the West Coast to Japan. Um, that really made me passionate about innovation, venture capital, and startups. I took on several roles in uh, uh, more than a dozen uh, startup companies across from biotech to quantum computing to very different things. Um, and so I moved to Boston. Uh, I worked at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where I had up data for operations and research because there is always a lot of challenges in taking something that looks promising in research to the operational um, you know, daily life of a hospital. And then I joined uh, a, comp a small startup that at the time was our supplier. That was Health Catalyst, uh, which uh, then you know quickly grew until we took it public in 2019. I had again uh, an enormous honor and privilege to work with the leadership team there, with some probably the best CEO I've ever so far worked with in my life. Dan Burton, there, great culture, great company, um, and then. 
after you know after Health Catalyst went public, I uh, moved uh, mainly for for love, for personal reasons, to to Singapore. Uh, took a sabbatical, uh, regrouped, and I really wanted to build a, a sort of global uh, you know healthcare impact driven fund. Uh, but I was approached by the Angelini family, uh, who were very um, you know driven by really great values to build something that was quite similar to what I was thinking of setting out to do. Um, and making a long story short, we, you know, we worked on it for about a year and a half in various ways. And, and now together with Paolo Di Giorgio, who was at the time uh, managing the venture arm of the Angelini Pharma, which is one of the subsidiaries of Angelini Industries, uh, we, we launched Angelini Ventures. And so it's uh, it's been a great, a great journey up to here. That's a great summary. And I, I love the diversity of your experience. I mean, you've, you've clearly had that kind of digital data technology side. You've worked in big pharma, but you've also been very close to the patient and seen the impact this can have firsthand. And it's it's nice to hear how all of that is perhaps coming together in, in what you're doing now. Thanks for sharing that. And we're, we're going to talk about Angelina Ventures and what you're doing in a moment. Before we go there, I do always like to ask if you can share something about you beyond work, any passions that you can share beyond work? And is there any application of that to your daily life at work? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the, I think actually so daily passions are the only way to be uh, meaningful at work. I mean, that's how I, I view it. And I think some of the best companies have that sort of culture, right? That if you have a, a good life, a balanced life, then you give your best at work. Right. And I would say, you know, some of the, I mean, a bit like with my work, my passions have evolved over, you know, and changed over time. Each of them teaches me something. I think uh, any, you know, my Path, for example, becoming, you know, doing a yoga teacher training and doing yoga for many years uh, was definitely transformational in, you know, in, in bringing uh, work-life balance. And I think it allows me to approach a lot of the uh, work, uh, you know, uh, projects, issues, challenges in a way that you look at your you know, teammates, your peers, or or even, you know, the startup founders in a, in a different way. You look at you yeah. know, how they can succeed uh, in a different way. So that's definitely, you know, yoga and meditation are definitely, uh, you know, two aspects that are foundational uh, to, you know, to, to everything I do and that have helped me a lot in approaching people. Um, something that is somewhere between work and, and you know, in personal life is mentoring and, uh, and, and coaching is something that I've uh, really enjoyed doing over time and in different ways and, uh, and has given me a lot of, uh, you know, just uh, very yeah, great, great personal moments and of gratitude and 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 personal satisfaction. And then anything where I can move in nature, so whether it's skiing, diving, trying kite surfing now, anything that gets me moving is always good. Sounds like a fantastic balance to maybe some of the more stressful days at work, particularly the yoga piece. Could be some good application there. So, and, and thank you for sharing that. So let, let's talk about Angelini Ventures. And obviously there are, are other corporate venture funds around. What do you see as making Angelini Ventures really different to other corporate venture funds? Yeah, I always joke that, you know, I, I think we should have a tagline that says this is not a corporate fund, <laughs> uh, a corporate venture fund. Um, and the reason for saying that is that, you know, Angelini Ventures uh, was built with a very um, clear premise, which is we believe healthcare is going to change dramatically. We believe there's going to be some fundamental shifts in how healthcare uh, transforms. We also believe it's not just going to happen overnight with some magic trick. It's, it's going to oh. be a complex uh, process that will take years. Uh, and we also feel that there aren't so many players and we should actually have more uh, you know, large, you know, Fortune 500 companies that believe it and put, you know, enough capital behind it. So even though we're not one of those, you know, giants in terms of, you know, uh, you know, our, our position in the market, we have made an outsized bet, right? Because a 300 million fund for a company that has a 2 billion turnaround is, a, is an outsized bet. And the reason why it's an outsized bet is that we're really looking at very long-term strategic bets. We're not here you know, as many corporate funds to look for something that could be an add-on or a bolt-on to our existing businesses, not uh, not directly at least. Um, we're looking at those, you know, those founders and companies that will do something meaningful that over time will become meaningful businesses. Um, and that also means that we're patient 
Uh, we're very financially driven, so we act like a financial VC. We don't back something that is just strategic and you know a great dream, but does not have the right numbers. Yeah. Um, but we're looking at things that in 10, 20 years could become sustainable, standalone, impactful pillars for a group like Angelini, right? So there is a corporate strategy element, which is to find things that over, you know, over time could be. Uh, could be meaningful for us, but it's not that short-term driven view, and it's not with the typical governance of having to have someone in an existing operational company say yes, we vow, you know, we are okay with that investment. It's really a standalone VC that works directly with the holding company and specifically with you know the CEO of the Angelini Group uh, is uh, in our investment committee, and we make decisions together. Yeah, and and that, as you outlined, that long-term focus is really clear. But I guess we have to acknowledge we are right now in the midst of quite uncertain economic times. So why launch it now? Why is now the right time? So it's uh, it's actually a fantastic time to to launch a venture fund. I mean, if you look at uh, venture funds whose vintage was just after a crisis, there are some of those that performed the best. Um, so. I mean, this will sound definitely harsh to a startup founder, and I've been on the other side, but uh, very, you know, transparently speaking, we can now sit down and talk to startups for quite a while. We're not rushed into a deal, right? There is a, a so, you know, there is a recognition of that. Um, the valuations are, are reasonable. Uh, but beyond the more, I would say, cynical, you know, almost cynical aspects of the fact that, you know, you're in a good position as a fund, I think there are also some very value-driven aspects, which is, Businesses that are onto something that is not a, a short-term bubble, uh, that is not just a you know a fancy pitch deck with I don't know some great people on an advisory board, etc. But who are onto something real and concrete, they'll still raise very good capital from good sources. If you look at the fundraising environment for VCs this year, I, I, it's been really interesting. It's been a bimodal distribution of how long it took them to fundraise. The ones that are strong VCs that have great track record actually raised capital faster than usual. The ones that are, you know, first time raising with so-and-so track record, many of them are not closing. So that means that there is, you know, there is a stronger syndicate of really good VCs who have been doing this for 20, 30 years, who are ready to put capital into good companies with good founders, but also doing very deep due diligence and asking very good questions. So, So I think it's actually a really good time to build companies that will make an impact in the next 10, 20 years. Um, And we find that, you know, we we're building very good syndicates. We can, you know, collaborate with funds in a very open manner. Uh, We can take our time to really understand in depth the startup, get to know everyone on the team, uh, get to know, you know, what their business is about. And also, I mean, (laughs) an old friend who's been doing this for 50 years or so told me, you know, if they're raising money, it's because they're imperfect. And you just have to understand whether the imperfections are something you can live with and you can help with. Right. And so you can get down to that depth of conversation of understanding these imperfections, seeing also how the founders react to say, oh, thank you. That's a really interesting idea. Let's work on it together or whether they, you know, they're a bit too sort of uh, standoffish and proud and, you know, and don't want to kind of understand and and shape the business in, in a direction that will help them to grow. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And of course, we always have these sort of short term economic fluctuations. But I think what is clear is that you're looking for long term sustainable solutions that you can work with. And and I guess in that sense, there's never a a bad time to do this. Let's talk a bit about the team that you have at Angelini Ventures. And and I want to just come back to you for a moment. We heard about your background and this incredibly diverse career that you've had that's brought you to Angelini Ventures. So what do you think is the key thing that you bring to the team and how do you see this complementing the team that you work with around you? Yeah, we're very proud of the, you know, even though we're a, a young uh, a young kid on the block, but we're very proud already, immensely proud of the diversity of backgrounds and of our team. Um, so starting from your question about me, um, a, so from a personal character trait perspective, uh, I'm very much a person that, you know, is a, a people person, a vision, you know, long-term vision person, uh, an optimist uh, by nature. So I'm on that sort of you know, side of the spectrum Um, from obviously from a, you know, more, you know, core competency background, I can sort of debunk, you know, when somebody talks about AI or or tech, I can, I can go relatively deep having run a lot of teams there because we we tend to pepper a little bit too much the world with AI these days. Um, So, you know, obviously the tech part, the fact of having 
I think, you know, my trajectory in life has helped me to see healthcare from the different perspectives, right? From the hospital, the patient, yeah. the, the pharma company, uh, and then with health catalysts also a little bit sort of the, the, the broader, you know, payer provider space. Um, so I, I tend to look at the problem from, you know, from different, uh, from different directions. Um, as, as for the team, I mean, we really complement each other in so many ways. I mean, uh, Paolo brings, a, you know, a, a fantastic background in, in hardcore science, neuroscience. He was at Harvard doing some seminal work in stem cells. And when we work on brain health, I feel like we have a stellar, you know, stellar team already, not just with him, but with other people on the team. He also, you know, Paolo and I work really well together because he complements me in being much more uh, analytical, uh, you know, fact-driven, track record-driven, uh, you know, f- focused on, you know, uh, on, on those aspects so we can really bounce ideas off each other and we have a good mutual trust and mutual respect with him, and but, you know, with the team as a whole uh, to kind of leverage each other's strengths and weaknesses, I would say. Um, then we have, I call her Gabby, we all call her Gabby Gabriela Manrique in, uh, in Boston, amazing you know she's a generalist she doesn't you know she doesn't have because the problem with us scientists is we can tend to be a little bit you know sidetracked and get too excited by you know by the science she (laughs) she comes from you know from amazing places like f prime she's worked years at f prime but she's also had really hands-on growth experience especially in SaaS models so she she brought toast the company toast from you know 15 employees to something like a thousand employees in ipo um and she's worked at Gazelle. She's worked at, you know, she was kind of the F prime person in residence to to help companies grow and succeed. And then she was at O'Reilly as a, you know, as a CFO of the group and also their venture group, et cetera. So, so she brings, you know, really strong financial and operational background um, and global experience across, you know, Asia, Europe, and and uh, and US. Um, so yeah, and we have uh, we have uh, Thomas based in Copenhagen. We worked at UCB Ventures. He was been working both in venture capital and business development, both digital and life sciences. Uh, Filippo, who is a Fortune 30 under 30 in venture capital in Italy, he was actually behind the the first unicorn uh, in Italy when he was at Tim Ventures. He's also worked at Rocket Internet, so uh, he's done a lot of work uh, uh, being a, thir- a 30 under 30. Um, we uh, we have Fabrizio Calisti who's joining us as medical director with great background both in pharma um, as well as a psychiatrist by by training and uh, and we have some exciting hires coming up that I can't name yet but we're very excited about. Watch this space. Fantastic. It sounds like a great team, but it it also strikes me as a very diverse team in terms of geographic location. And you mentioned a few of those there. So was this a conscious decision to kind of hire in different global locations versus central headquarters? Absolutely. And you know, and and, and thankfully in a post-pandemic world, it was more kind of accepted and acceptable. Oh. But I think it's a it's a core strength that we have. We we want to hire people in in places that are hubs of what we do um, and where they are already active members of those hubs. Uh, and it's a win-win situation. It makes us very strong in terms of talent attraction. I, I have to say both Paolo and I have been humbled by the level of interest for the positions that we have open and we're opening. Um, it also means that we enter, you know, from an investment perspective, we enter a market, uh, you know, we're hitting the ground running, right? We, if we hire somebody, uh, let's say in, in Berlin, that has been active for years in that space, um, you know, they bring on their experience, their network, their expertise. We can organize events there and quickly get to know someone. And when we enter a due diligence for a company, uh, you know, people get surprised by how much sort of local right. insider knowledge we already have. Um, we've also had to balance it, of course. I mean, there, there's so many articles being published about how to make hybrid work. Um, so we balance it by meeting every two months, usually in Rome, in our beautiful headquarters in Rome. Usually nobody says no when you invite them for you know to spend a week in Rome. So <laughs> yes, we do have that, that. Competitive, competitive advantage as well. I, I I always joke with no offense to Chicago that it beats Chicago. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but no, it's been a great uh, ride, and it uh, it also helps I think in the talent attraction. You know, people speak about diversity. I think when they get on the job interviews with four or five of us, they realize that, you know, diversity for us is, is just a way of being. It's not a slogan. Uh, we, we couldn't be more diverse in terms of you know our backgrounds and all of that. 
That, that, that's great. And, and obviously you're based in Singapore. I presume you, you enjoy being in Singapore, but you must travel around quite a bit. Do you have a favorite place to go outside of Singapore? Yeah, so we're actually, I mean, we're uh, literally post-pandemic life. So we actually spend about 50% of our time in Italy uh, because, you know, of my role and everything. I do spend a lot of time working, you know, elbow to elbow with Paolo and the team. So so we, we spend about 50% of the time in Italy and we have a base there. And the other 50%, you know, uh, here in Singapore or in Asia uh, in general. A favorite place, uh, rather very hard. I think the fondest recent memory the memories I have, uh, just to mention a place that is not maybe on everybody's map, is Sumatra uh, mm-hmm. in Indonesia, uh, a fantastic uh, location that is not so well known, Lake Toba, one of the oldest volcanic lakes in the world. Um, just, yeah, beautiful. Fantastic. We'll probably do a whole separate podcast on Sumatra. I've not been <laughs> felt, but I'd love to hear more about it at some point. And and you touched on there, obviously, you've got the Italian heritage, the Italian roots, you're based in Singapore. Those are both markets that are, are quite hot in terms of startups. Where do you see the similarities and where do you see the differences between those markets? Oh, that's a good question. So so Italy has been really, really late to the game, um, but it's been very interesting because exactly like probably just in the last two to three years, it's become a hot market. I think some recent statistics put Milan as like the third fastest growing in right. Europe. Uh, and there is a you know strong angel network, the first unicorns, there's a lot happening. I think the pandemic has helped a lot the relocation also of smart Italians around the world who said, you know what, I could actually live you know, in the country that you know I love and I want to live in and and yeah. still you know do a build a global business, etc. Um to your question of, of comparing uh, Singapore and Italy, um, the first thing that comes to mind are certainly differences. I think unless you spend time living and traveling and here in Asia, you, I think for a lot of uh, people who might be listening from you know Western, whatever Western means nowadays, but you know a European or North American country, um, it's hard to imagine how much the world has changed. I mean, sometimes when you travel back from Asia to Europe. You feel like Europe is a few years behind when you talk about actual business models right. and yeah. startups and how, you know, like something as simple as a super app has just not happened yet, right, in Europe or US, right? I mean, if you think of Grab in Asia and what you can do on Grab, which is literally anything from, you know, yeah. buying your food to shopping to deliveries to nowadays payments, uh, healthcare is coming up. I mean, there's so much happening on these super apps in China and in Asia at large. So so there is definitely a disconnect in how rapidly things have shifted in certain segments uh, um, in Asia. Um, and I think for, for our world, for the you know, world of healthcare, it's it's fascinating how emerging economies, uh, you know, when it comes to brick and mortar, can still be a little bit like you know, what we imagine of an emerging economy. So still having to to you know to improve infrastructure, et cetera. But when it comes to digital there, you know, they're years ahead, right? I mean, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's the payment industry or, or the delivery systems or just the way people live digitally. Um, so the, the differences definitely come first in uh, in my mind. Uh, the difference vice versa is that, for example, Singapore is still a relatively risk averse uh, culture. So you'll find it quite vibrant in businesses that are easy to back, right? Where there is a clear consumer uh, yeah. traction and you have very you know very obvious consumer attraction curves and then you put money and you kind of know that you're going to make money it's still relatively risk averse when it comes to you know out of the box innovation or 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 areas that require you know very long term capital uh, to make long term bets it's it's a challenge that i mean singapore wants to embrace and is trying to do something about but you know the first rounds are easier to come by than the later rounds um, and so on. So, so that's the difference where I would say in Europe there's, you know, a long-term sort of tradition of, of venture capital that takes very long-term bets. And there's also a little bit of that national pride, whether it's in France or UK or Germany, and now a little bit in Italy with, you know, government-backed VCs and just a VC ecosystem that will kind of stay the course and back a company for several rounds until they can really make it and try to keep it in um, Italy. Uh, what's in common? I mean, I think the aging the aging aspect is very similar between Italy and Singapore. Um, so trying to tackle trying to tackle anything that can make you know start resolving aging, I 
I always find it puzzling that, you know, I always say if we could build, if a startup could build anything that costs as much as a dishwasher and makes our <laughs> great parents' life better, whatever it is, safer, you know, more yeah. compliant with drugs. But somehow we haven't cracked it yet. So I think that's a huge untapped potential, right, to build some technology that can really help the elderly age gracefully and then their caregivers be less worried about them. Uh, so I think that's something that that there is in common. And then I would say in general, the healthcare challenge commonalities are much greater than people think. There is this really interesting graph showing that, yes, 10, 20 years ago, a country like Indonesia, for example, had you know the typical emerging economy problems. Now the problems are identical to your right cardiovascular you know, the, uh, is the number one killer. So, so, th so it's been completely flattened out. Like there is no difference in what are the top killers in healthcare um, in an in a so-called emerging uh, economy in Asia. Yeah, and no, it, it's a great point. And I guess one of the challenges is as we address more diseases earlier in life, we have aging populations, many more comorbidities, and exactly the kind of challenge. Um, that you outline, but I also like the point you make about technology sort of coming from Asia to other markets. I think we see that trend outside of healthcare as well, so definitely one to watch. Um, let's take a look forward, and I know you sort of, you know, almost at the start of this journey with Angelini Ventures, but can you talk about what you're looking forward to in the next five years, anything you're particularly excited about? Yeah, so so we, you know, the way we built Angelini Ventures, where uh, a little bit ahead of the first day, we already have eight investments in our portfolio um and so even though the public launch was recently we we have had quite a bit of work behind the scenes and we do think a lot about long-term strategy uh we're definitely very excited about you know the the strategic impact that we can have at least in some verticals um two verticals that we're you know very uh excited about our brain health and women's health yeah and um and they're both verticals where well, let's start from brain health. Brain health, uh, and even more specifically, for example, neurodevelopmental disorders, so the first you know, 10, 20 years of life, we feel there is such a potential, especially because our approach is across you know, medical device, digital life sciences, to leverage this diverse uh, approach uh, to make a strong multiplier effect for an even stronger impact. What I mean by that is if you, for example, diag you know, there's amazing potential to diagnose uh, autism, dyslexia, just to give two examples, much earlier than we do right now. And we have a huge gap in, di in diagnosing these diseases. We diagnose them way too late. Now, if you diagnose them earlier, and there are some great clinical studies showing you could diagnose autism as early as two years of age, you completely alter the path of these kids because you find out early that there is a problem. It means the brain is still extremely plastic. You can then intervene yeah. in ways that are less disruptive with digital you know, therapeutics and, and behavioral health, et cetera, so that you never even see the full spectrum of the disease that you would have seen, you know, that you would see today because it's caught way too late, right? So there's really, I mean, a scientific premise as to why getting in earlier and then modifying it earlier, you have a better outcome overall. And for us, what's exciting is that there are startups trying to tackle this at every stage, right? So there are startups that are trying to diagnose early. There are startups that are doing really cool tech to, you know, to uh, be therapeutic, uh, sort of digital therapeutics interventions that can alter it earlier. There are startups that are innovating in the biotech space uh, for these diseases. So we're excited about that. We're excited that you could take some verticals and kind of invest in an ecosystem of startups that are each doing their thing and they should do, right? That's why we're not a traditional corporate VC. We don't want them to distract them from what they're doing. We want to back them, support yeah. them, get these founders yeah. to work together and talk to each other. Um, so I think that's that's incredibly exciting. Of course, COVID has put a spotlight on mental health. We recently invested in Serenis. Uh, you know, we really we found the, find the founders amazing. They're doing, uh, you know, something that looks easy, which is psychotherapy online. A lot of companies do it. Uh, but they do it in a really meaningful way. They take top psychotherapists, uh, you know, they match the patient to the psychotherapist in the right way. There is really uh, good sort of outcomes and good experiences for the, you know, for the patients. And you just make it accessible and you have impact today on something that is affecting so many people. And we also hope that it shifts, you know, there is a cultural shift needed which is to get in earlier and earlier and earlier. So yeah. get in not when you have a problem and it's 1 a.m. and you feel that you really need help, but when you just feel a little bit off balance and, you know, you think that it would be good, you know, to speak to someone and, and figure out what is 
putting you off balance. So, so we're excited about those two spaces specifically and brain health in general. We think, you know, this multimodal approach can have a fantastic impact. We're just starting to think about women's health, something that is also very close to the Angelini world because of uh, we have a you know, consumer goods company that produces uh, hygienic pads for women. It also produces diapers for babies. So the entire maternity space and women's health space for us is, is very interesting. The reason why it's interesting, and we have a you know one of our board members, Jessica Federer, uh, former CEO of Bayer, and now launched uh, sure. a women's health fund. She always reminds us, you know, women's health is more than women body parts, right? The the problem with men investing in women's health is that they think of fertility, uh, they think of you know uh, tracking your period and all those things. Actually, women's health is the fact that they suffer more from autoimmune diseases, that they are not enrolled in trials as often. There are so many aspects of women's health. They, you know, they live longer and they get affected by, by dementia more, et cetera. So, so women's health is a very undervalued space. There are disease areas like endometriosis, which have just been completely undervalued by the market, mainly because it was a market made by men, you know, uh, yeah. the way pharma invested yeah. in the past, et cetera. So, so yeah. those are two areas that, you know, we're, we're very excited about. Fantastic. And yeah, a big shout out to Jessica. I met her when she was at Bayer and I've tracked her work since. You're right. She's doing some amazing stuff. Um, and what you outlined there about brain health as well. You know, there's a lot we don't know about the brain, as you know, but what we do know is it is almost like a muscle with this plasticity that you can train it and retrain it if you get in there early. So it seems like a fantastic ambition. And any sort of beyond that, any emerging healthcare trends or technologies that you think are really interesting or, or promising, maybe some of the earlier stuff? I mean, to me, what's personally exciting is the technologies that drastically reduce access barriers, right? So I feel like, you know, we spent a lot of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century um, getting excited rightly about what technology and science can do. Um, but we also became so excited that a lot of it is very expensive and in, very inaccessible, very right. hard to replicate, very hard to scale. Right. So if I think of some of the most sophisticated, you know, cell and gene therapies that I was involved in, I mean, when we produced them, they were great, but they were impossible to scale. And that has, you know, then become evident as, as some of these biotechs, you know, had to, uh, you know, grow. And now we finally have, you know, some very interesting companies that try to address those gaps. So I'm particularly excited by the fact that now, you know, a small device. Uh, can really accelerate the pace of diagnosis, you know, uh, having a family with a non, you know, with a, uh, a healthcare worker that might have just gotten a one month of training, you know, be able to get, you know, early diagnosis or early therapy, early intervention on a lot of diseases. So, so to me, those are the most exciting uh, things to emerge, what you can do at home and what you can do in a simple setting, what you can do, uh, you know, for example, in women's health, we're just starting to see exciting technologies looking at what what does uh, period blood or vaginal discharge tell about a woman's health and how much could that take us further in diag early early diagnostics uh, uh, monitor disease monitoring and therefore empowering the next wave yeah. of biotechs that wants to tackle those um, you know those areas or you know or technologies that you know that allow um, you know, quick and quick and easy stethoscope-like, but much more in-depth understanding yeah. of a baby. Uh, you know, for uh, especially for you know remote areas, etc. So those are, you know, personally are the ones that you know I, I, I'm most uh, uh, most excited about. I think something that will take a lot longer is then uh, you know a venture ecosystem, a venture capital ecosystem, uh, and an industry ecosystem that also enables that to then reach all those places, right? Because we still don't have, you know, a very strong, uh, very strong ecosystem that, you know, that gets us to um, to those places. Like I'm thinking of companies like Reach52 that is doing amazing work in Kenya, Indonesia, Cambodia, et cetera, yeah. to really market shape, like to create a market where it didn't exist because people never even saw a doctor yeah. or pharmacist in their village. So, yeah. so I think that will take time. That's like my yeah, personal yeah. passion. Uh, but those are the trends that I'm yeah, uh, more excited about in the long term. That, that's a great point. And, and in what you were saying there, this real influx of diagnostics and monitoring that's putting things in the hands of the person, integrating into their daily routines, 
but also as you outline you know health equity equality access that there's a lot of challenges there as well that that you know i certainly hope we can address so let me bring it right back to the next 12 months as we're recording this we're december 2022 we're almost into 2023 it's been, as we all know, a kind of crazy couple of years with COVID and everything going on. So could you dare to make any predictions for next year, 2023, if there's anything in particular you're most excited about? I think, I mean, the the area that I, I hope will emerge in 23 is that when you mentioned the word digital therapeutics, anybody who's been there long enough and has invested often, you know, get the uh, starts kind of shivering or trembling because they got, you know, they got a little bit burnt in the early days by investing yeah. in companies that, you know, took a lot of money and then deliver in, you know, in terms of revenues and so on, or approvals. I think 23 uh, could be the first turning point, at least in some countries where some companies emerge saying, hey, actually, I got it approved and I actually sold my product and I had an impact on people. Um, so I think, you know, since you're asking for a very short term window, I think that's a you know a realistic prediction is that next year, hopefully, when you sit around at the conference, at least a fraction of the people at the table will be, you know, a little bit more bullish about digital therapeutics than they've been in the past. That's a great ambition. We should reconnect in December 2023 and see how far we've shifted. Sounds good. <laughs> not, not entirely up to us, but you know, yeah, of more, but let's see where we've got to. Well, look, I, I think that that's been a fantastic, you know, coverage of your journey, what you're doing at Angelina Ventures. I've really enjoyed speaking to you today, Elia. So thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I hope all of you who've been listening have enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. It was great talking to you.